Welcome to Story Connections, where we discuss books and all the wonderful, exciting, frightening, and fascinating tales they present, and how all these things pertain to our lives. Now, here are your hosts, Katherine Townsend and Rebecca Guthrie. Hi, I'm Rebecca Guthrie. And I'm Katherine Townsend. And this is Story Connections. And if you want to connect with us online, you can visit us at whystoriesmatter.com or facebook.com forward slash whystoriesmatter. And we'd love to hear from you. Um, you can also call into the show at uh, 790-2040 if you would like to be part of the conversation today. So today we are going to be talking about dystopia novels and... Um, probably end up a little bit about politics because you can't really have a conversation about dystopia without talking about politics and how you think the world should work. So um, again, we'd really love to have you join in at uh, 790-2040. But we're just going to dive right in. We aren't going to do the commonly thought of dystopia novels. So we're not going to do Brave New World, 1984, Fahrenheit 451, or other books like that because most people have read them, and even if they don't, they're commonly enough known in American culture that if I say Big Brother, you have an idea what that means. Um, what we're going to um, talk about is more um, obscure dystopic novels because they all, in my opinion, influence each other. So so where are we starting? We are going to start with The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. Um, and probably most people wouldn't think of this immediately as a dystopic novel. Um, but it really, if you read it, actually is because it talks about going into the future and how screwed up the future and human beings have become. Well, also, it's social commentary. It is very much social commentary. So H.G. Wells was commentaring, uh, commentaring, commenting on Victorian society through some of the comments that he was making about the uh, Morlocks in particular, but the, cla- I guess, class divisions. Right. Um, so uh, The Time Machine was published in 1895, and it is H.G. Uh, Wells is credited as both the uh, grandfather of science fiction as a genre and also as the beginning of talking about dystopic endings of the world because in... Um, a brief synopsis of the time machine, the uh, time traveler, and that's what he's called in the book. H.G. Wells is the narrator, and he refers to the time traveler as the time traveler. And never gives him a name. And never gives him a name. Um, travels for, Builds a time machine, travels forward into the future, and discovers these small, childlike creatures that he calls the Eloi. And, you know, they're very frivolous and very simple and... He thinks that this that human beings have evolved to such a place that they don't need to struggle or worry about anything anymore. And eventually he finds out that that's not true, that uh, humanity has sort of separated into two classes, the Eloys, who are small children who are very simple, and then the Morlocks, who basically prey on the Eloys and eat them. That's what they, they eat, the Eloys. Right. They become cannibals. And it's also significant that the Eloi live above ground and the Morlocks live underground. Right, because you have to remember that in 19, or sorry, excuse me, in 1895, in England, there was still very much the upstairs, downstairs mentality. Um, if for anybody who's been watching the, the British show, the upstairs are, you know, the wealthy and the downstairs are the servants. And, and the people who work. And the people who work. Um, and there's very much a class distinction and a, a huge amount of so- snobbery going both directions. So it, it was the social commentary that we as modern readers don't pick up on, especially in America, because it's not something that we don't think of people as being below stairs. Right. And that's their place. And they really are going to have to struggle to get above stairs. Um, You know, occasionally a Cinderella story will happen, but it's not that common. Um, And it's sort of a scandal. Yeah. And it's sort of a scandal, you know, and you can even see that if we're going to put it more modern, you know, um, a more modern day with the the Brits. You can see that in Prince William marrying Catherine Middleton. You know, this is a bit it's actually we as Americans don't really understand what a big deal it is that Catherine Middleton is a commoner. But it's a big deal that she married a commoner because she has no royal blood in her or or, or 
noble blood or noble blood. Her father was a uh, her grandfather uh, was a coal miner. Um, and as Americans, we're like, oh, it's a fairy tale story and this is great. But as Brits that I and I've talked to a lot of I have uh, several British friends. They've talked about we've talked about that dynamic of it's very strange because that's not how they even though it's, you know, the 21st century, they still have those class distinctions. So in the time traveler or the time traveler, when he's talking about the distinctions between the Eloy and the Morlock, he's talking about the distinctions between the productive class and the unproductive class. And uh, it takes him a while to understand that the productive class is actually preying on the unproductive class. Right. Um, and H.G. Uh, Wells, if you had to classify him, would be a de- would be downstairs. You know, he was a teacher. He did a whole bunch of things. And he was trying to become an upstairs person. Um, and his books that he, and he wrote later in his life allowed that to happen. But this was his first book, and it was really his trying to figure that out. Right. So the reason that this book is significant is because it lays a foundation for dystopic novels throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century because it was the first one. And uh, not that it was the first book that was social commentary. It wasn't by any stretch of the imagination. But it was the first book that... Uh, an author really said, hey, if we continue to do what we're doing, what are we going to get? And that's the heart of a dystopic novel. Uh, it asks people to think about where are we, what are we doing, why are we doing it, should we be doing it, and what is going to happen if we continue to do it? Right. And those are important conversations that we need to be having. I mean, and especially in America right now, this year is an election year. You wouldn't really know that, at least it feels like this year that you don't really can't tell that midterms are going on. But there are midterm elections. And in two years, we're going to have another presidential election. And we've had five and a half years of the Obama administration like it, hate it feel blah about it that is a true statement and we're starting to have we've been having and we're starting to have the conversation about where are we going what does america look like what are we going to do and these books allow us to look at what other people have said and what we need to be thinking about as a society about what we want well one of the things that i thought about as i was reading these books and for all of them except the time machine it was the first time well okay not the young adult novels but the the older uh dystopian novels it was the first time i'd read them yes i had not was- read the iron heel or um neuromancer or it can't happen or here. it can't happen here uh and i found myself thinking you know I actually think that these would have been better books to have us read in high school than the ones that we actually read. Yeah, I actually agree with that. The way um, I, um, for most of the shows, I'm the one that picks the books that we'll read. Next week, Catherine's picking the books, but for most of the shows, I pick the books. And truthfully, the way that I found these these books was I knew I didn't want to do the commonly done dystopic novels because you know, everything that there is to be said about Brave New World or 1984 or Fahrenheit 451 has been said by somebody at some point because they're so commonly read. And also we talked about them earlier. In right. The, in and the, we've also talked a little bit about them. Um, so I Googled dystopia novels and Wikipedia had a list and I went through Wikipedia's list and I started reading the synopsis of synopsis. Yes. I don't know. I don't know what the plural of synopsis is. Synopsis is? I think probably synopsis. Wait a minute. Two English, <laughs> English majors yeah. here and you don't? No. Yeah, no. Sorry, Harry. That That's the voice of Harry, our engineer, and he's giving us a hard time. Which uh, we deserve. Yeah, we do. Um, and if you know the answer to that question, you can call in and tell us at 790-2040. <laughs> um, but um, I picked them because... They seemed really interesting. The synopsis of the books that I read made me think, oh, this is something that we should talk about, we should read, because these have valuable things to say. And one of the books that I I picked, but I wasn't able to get my hands on a copy of it because it's not, um, they had to, it's out of print, was um, The City Without Jews, which is a uh, dystopic novel about what happens when you get rid of all of the Jews and the author that wrote it was assassinated by a member of the Nazi party because he hated this book so much because there was so much truth in it 
that he said, you know what, this idea is too dangerous and I'm going to kill you because I hate this idea so much. And that's what books do. So um, that that's part of why I picked the books that we're going to be talking about and that we are, are currently talking about. Um, but I wanted to start with The Time Machine. And all of the books that we are going to be talking about on the show, we're doing in chronological order. And we're doing it that way because... Um, they all influence each other. Even if the author who hasn't read the book before, it's part of the lexicon. Um, but we have a caller. Charles? Yeah, the flow of synopsis is synopsolescent. <laughs> okay, there we go. It's, it's synopses. Synopses? But, synopses, right. Okay. So, but um, I'm wondering, though, if we don't have a modern neologism for the... Uh, well, for the Morlocks, don't they all now work for motor vehicle? You know, that may be true. <laughs> I refer to, to going there as feeding the Morlocks, and some of the ones that are maybe have a little bit of more length than the tooth actually get it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you well, so thank much. You for sharing. I may adopt that, actually. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, what do you mean, may? Right, <laughs> okay, I'm going to adopt that. <laughs> thank you, Charles, for calling, and we appreciate it. Um. So something I wanted to say really quick, in addition to building on each other, I think that talking about them in a chronological fashion is important because I think each of them is somewhat prescient of the things that are going to be happening. So we had authors telling us, hey, you need to be thinking about these things because they may come to pass. And sure enough, as you look, in, there's like a progression of these things are coming to pass. Right. You know, in... In 1895, the world wars hadn't, both world wars hadn't happened. We don't, didn't have the internet. There's all of these things that we put on it that we didn't have. Um, so I wanted to leave one last thing just so people have this little bit of trivia. Um, the time machine is the first time that a device that was built into the, to move into the future or back in, uh, into the past was used. It, the time machine, H.G. Wells coined the term time machine, and it, we now obviously have, it's a very common thing that we talk about, but that's it. So you are listening to Story Connections, and we will catch you on the other side. <laughs> Miss a show? Hear the podcast through our website, kvoi.com. Intelligent weekend talk that's live and local, only on AM 1030, KVOI, The Voice. Call in now, 790-2040. That's 790-2040. Hi, welcome back to Story Connections. We are talking about dystopia this week. And uh, we just finished up talking about The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. And the next book that we are going to talk about is uh, The Iron Heel by Jack London. Um, so The Iron Heel was published in 1908, and it is commonly considered the uh, earliest modern dystopian novel in terms of po politics as we think about it in the 20th and 21st century. And um, it actually had a huge impact on George Orwell in the writings that George Orwell did. Uh, George Orwell actually said that he thinks that it's more important to read The Iron Heel in school than he thought it was to read Brave New World. So, you know, from a man that we consider to be you know, one of the premier dystopia novelists, I think that's very high praise. Yeah, I, I think that the reason that we don't uh, read The Iron Heel is because history education would have to be so much better than that's it really is because London actually refers to historical figures. That's probably very true. Um, so a brief synopsis, and I'm not going to be ruining the book in the synopsis uh, because in a spoiler the, in the beginning. The spoiler in the beginning. So I'm not going to tell you anything that Jack London doesn't write in the preface to his book. So in the preface to the book that he writes, it, um, it uh, starts as a manuscript called the Everhard Manuscript, written by Avis Everhard, um, that she wrote and hid that was found centuries later. And it's being uh, introduced by this historian, um, Anthony Meredith, who is basically annotating the the manuscript like you would read, you know, if you read Shakespeare and you have an annotated copy that they're explaining this is what this means, this is what this means, so that you have better context. It's the exact same thing. And what 
uh, Meredith tells us in the preface to the Iron Heel is that uh, um, Avis and uh, her husband er uh, Ernest both die. They're both killed. Um, that there is no happy ending, that you're not going to find it at the end of this book, that, you know, they were part of the... Um, an unsuccessful struggle. An unsuccessful struggle, and that there were m multiple unsuccessful struggles. For until centuries. Right, centuries of unsuccessful struggles, and this was just the second of a long line. But now, as, you know, these much more... Um, evolved. Uh, thank you. Evolved people we can look back on them and we appreciate the struggle because it shows us where we've come from, but we're much better than that, but don't expect a happy ending. And it was, I mean, it's a spoiler at the beginning of the book. At the beginning of the book, you already know, oh, this is going to be depressing. Yeah. And, it, and it is. It is. It's, so, it's poignant. So the book itself is, once you get into the Everhard manuscript, is essentially a diary. And she is chronicling her husband's struggle as a revolutionary against the oligarchy. And I don't think that you can talk about this book without talking about oligarchy. And I think oligarchy is the thing that links this book to today, because I believe that oligarchy is a real threat that the middle class faces. So why don't you go ahead and define oligarchy, Miss? I have a poli sci major. <laughs> okay. Um, oligarchy in its purest sense is rule by a small group of people. And that group of people can be connected by wealth, they can be connected by blood, they can be connected by influence, they can be connected because of military power. The key about an oligarchy is that it, a great deal of power is held in a very small number of people's hands. And I am not alone in saying we are facing an oligarchy taking over our country. Uh, there are a number of political scientists who have been making this observation. And actually, the only independent in um, the Senate, Bernie Sanders, made that observation. Um, and so what we're seeing is, you know, a small group of people, uh, primarily Wall Street bankers, but also... We find them in the Senate and in the House of Representatives. And in the tech world. And in the tech world, um, who or the billionaires, um, who have an, a disproportionate influence on the policies that this country adopts. And I don't mean to sound like a conspiracy theorist or a revolutionary, because I'm really not. Or an either, Occupy Wall Streeter. Or an Occupy Wall Streeter, because I'm really not any of those things. But I am concerned that I see the gap between the rich and the poor getting wider and wider. And part of the reason that I'm concerned about that is because I tell people I am an economic and political refugee from California. Uh, my husband and I moved here over 20 years ago because the middle class in California could not provide us with a way to um, raise our family the way that we wanted to. There was no way, given the cost of living in California, that I could stay home with our kids, and that was really important to us. Plus, the policies in California were becoming more and more liberal, and they were interfering more and more in people's ability to choose how to raise their own children. And we just decided that California was not the right place for us, and we left. Well, recently I read an article talking about the oligarchy that is arising in California out of the tech world in Silicon Valley. And if you read the newspapers coming out of San Francisco, there is huge resentment from longtime Bay Area residents against the money and wealth that um, the tech oligarchs are bringing into Northern California, making it impossible for people who have been there for generations to continue to live there. Right. Um, so the article was in uh, the Daily Beast, and it's linked at, at uh, our website, whystoriesmatter.com. You can go read it for yourself. And it's, it's rather long, but it talks about, you know, the fact that the Golden State, I'm going to just re read the quote. At the same time, the Golden State now suffers the highest level of poverty in the country, 23.5% compared to 16% nationally, worse than the long-term hard luck cases like Mississippi. It is now home to roughly one-third of the nation's welfare recipients, almost three times its proportion of the nation's population. 
Um, like medieval serfs, increasing numbers of Californians are downwardly mobile and doing worse than their parents. Native-born Latinos actually have shorter lifespans than their parents. And it goes on. I mean, there's a list of here are all of the things that are happening. Here are all of the problems. And Jack London's book, The Iron Heel, talks about why this is a problem. Now, he goes to socialism. And I don't. And fascism. And, fascism. And, and that is not the direction that we should be going. I, I, I agree. I don't think that so- socialism is the solution to oligarchy, and I don't think that fascism is the solution to oligarchy. I think representative government, where the government officials, the elected representatives, actually represent people, not corporations, is the answer. Right. But, you know, part of what we need to be having a conversation about is we are not a democracy We are a democratic republic, and there is a difference between a democracy, which is basically mob rule, and a democratic republic. And because we have started talking about, oh, we're a democracy, oh, we need to spread democracy, oh, we're the world's democracy people, people don't understand what it is that made America great. And because they don't understand what made America great, they don't understand how to get back to that. And books like The Iron Heel, which was published in 1908, prescient in what it was talking about, about this is where we're going and we've got to stop because if we don't, bad things are going to happen. And that is also what It Can't Happen Here by Sinclair Lewis is talking about. And this one was written, was published in 1935 and it um, is a political satire about what was going on in with in in uh, Europe with the rise of fascism and Germany and, and Germany with the with Hitler and all of these people were wandering around going, oh, well, that will never happen here. That will never happen here. There's no way that Americans will ever let socialism or communism or fascism come in and destroy our country, which is ironic because, um, you know, there was at least one movie that was quashed in Hollywood because Germany, the fascists. Uh, uh, were concerned that it would offend people in Germany. Right. Um, But you also saw that, you know, um, with, uh, I can't remember what the term, but um, the MacArthur era and McCarthyism McCarthyism and, you know, the, the red communists and people being blacklisted. But in It Can't Happen Here, it's a novel about the 1936 presidential election and how the Democratic candidate um, promises everybody, so, they have been in this depression because it, it, it's very modern when it was written. It, they've been in the depression for a very long time. People aren't getting better. The economy, the economy is, not is not getting better. Nothing good is happening. And this fake presidential candidate promises that everybody will have a job. The horrible Jews who are the, the bankers who are responsible for this are going to get kicked out of the country and or, or lose their property. Um, It's incredibly racist. So all of the um, black people are going to be uh, only allowed to make $10,000 a year, and they're going to have to give up all of their property. And everybody is going to get $5,000 a month from the government. Because he's he's paralleling what's happening in Nazi Germany. Right. So the way that this uh, fake presidential candidate gets elected is because he promises all of these good things. And, that you know, the minute he gets elected, the next day checks are going to go out to all of the poor people, giving them jobs and five thousand dollars a month, which was a I mean, it's a lot of money now. But at the time, that was a small fortune. And everybody's like, he's going to be the savior. He's going to fix America. And he turns it into, you know, he has the Minutemen who are the parody of the uh, brown shirts, brown shirts who show up and terrorize people and people get herded in, you know, all of the people who disagree. So the newspapers and the editors and writers and the pastors, they right. all get any herded. Critic. Any critic gets herded into concentration camps. And it made me so angry as I was reading this book because while it is, you know, was written 80 years ago, you can see a lot of those promises today. You can see people saying, I will promise, I promise to give you all of these things. I personally am not a big fan of Obama, but you can see that in the Obama phones. President Obama needs to get elected because I need to get my phone. It's the same level of I am owed something. And we need to be having those conversations about why that's not true. Well, you know, 
I am not an, a fan of Obamacare by any stretch of the imagination, and I'm actually actively offended when people say that health care is a right. And the reason I am actually actively offended when people say health care is a right is because I do not believe that you can have a right that requires someone else to perform a service for you. Because when you say health care is a right, what you are saying is that medical professionals belong to you that their labor, their skills, their knowledge, their time, their lives are yours and that you are entitled to the fruit of their labor simply because you exist. In essence, you're saying, if you are a medical professional, you are my slave. And I find that offensive. Health care is not a right. Yep, absolutely agree. But we are up against a break, so you are listening to Story Connections, and we'll catch you on the other side. Intelligent Talk 24-7. On 1030 KVOI, The Voice, on the web at KVOI.com. Intelligent Weekend Talk that's live and local, only on AM 1030 KVOI, The Voice. Call in now, 790-2040. That's 790-2040. Hi, welcome back to Story Connections. So we are talking about dystopia today, and before the break we were talking about The Iron Hill by Jack London and It Can't Happen Here by Sinclair Lewis, and we actually have a caller. So, hi, Larry. Welcome to Story Connections. Hello. Hi. I I just wanted to call and tell you how nice it is to hear you two ladies in the afternoon. Oh, well, Uh, thank you. You break up the all-boys club throughout the day. Oh, well, that's very sweet. Thank Thank you. you. We're very glad that you enjoy the show. We appreciate that. Uh, It's very very pleasant to uh, listen to you guys talk about your books. And today was extra revealing. I know you lean to the right. (laughs) But now you know how far right. Uh, congratulations. You got a fan. <laughs> well, Bye-bye. well, thank you. Thank you, Larry. We appreciate that, and thank you for calling in. Um, so, well, that was very sweet. It was very sweet. Um, so, to wrap up uh, It Can't Happen Here by Sinclair Lewis, um, we need to – I would highly encourage everybody to read that book and The Iron Heel. If you read nothing else this summer – if you have a summer reading list and you're traveling, put those on there. Um, we have links at our, uh, our website, whystoriesmatter.com, so you can go get them. Um, and I think they're both available on the Glutenberg Project as well. I didn't look that up, so I don't know, but they probably are because they're both over 100. Well, no, uh, but they're out of the public, do- or they're in public domain, I think. Okay, so you might also be able to get them through the Gutenberg Project, and the Gutenberg Pro- I believe it's uh, gutenbergproject.org. Um, but we have links on our website, whystoriesmatter.com, that you can go pick up these books. But, but the, really the point here is, please, please, when you are considering candidates, think about the future that you want. Don't just think about the next four years, but think about the next 20 years, the next 40 years, the next 60 years. Well, you know, I have an 18, 19-month-old. He just turned 19 months. And it changed me in a way that people talk about when you have kids, you look at the world in a different way. I am so angry on my son's behalf about the country that he is going to inherit, the debt that he is inheriting. And it's because people didn't think about long-term consequences of elections. And elections have consequences. And part of why I wanted to talk about dystopian novels is because these books talk about the consequences that elections can have. Not that they necessarily will have, but that they can have so that we can start having those conversations. And, you know... If you want to have, if you if you don't necessarily want to call in, but you want to have this conversation, we have a Facebook page specifically for that. It's fi- facebook.com forward slash why stories matter. And, you know, we would love to be part of that conversation with you about what you think about these things because it matters. And we need to be talking to each other. Even if you vehemently disagree with me, part of, and, and Catherine, part of what we need to do is start having those conversations again because we've stopped. We've started saying, if you don't agree with me 110%, I'm not going to listen to you and you're just a moron. And that stifles everybody. Or worse, we've said, if we don't like what you have to say, you're not allowed to say it. Right. 
I mean, and that really is happening. Yes. And I think that the correct answer to a, hating someone's opinion is to have a discussion in the marketplace of ideas. I don't think that the answer to hating someone's opinion is to tell them that they're not allowed to express their opinion. No. You know, I am a firm believer in Voltaire's. I may not agree with a word that you say, but I will fight to the death to defend your right to say it. You've got that almost right. Okay, how did I get it wrong? Say it back to me because I don't know how I screwed it up. (laughs) I may not agree with the word that you say, but I will defend to the death. You're right to say it. Okay. Um, But the idea is the same. It is the same. Whichever way you say it, um, which is ideas matter and ideas are important and there is no idea so scary that we can't even talk about it. Well, and the other thing is, is that the more dangerous an idea is, the more important it is to talk about it. Right. And... When we talk about it, we all are better off because there are ideas that should be immediately rejected. It is never, ever, 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 okay to rape a small child. That is not an idea that is okay ever. So we should reject that idea, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be able to talk about it. And part of the reason why it's important to talk about it, and again, I'm going to, you know, betray my right leanings, um, is that in a world where what has historically been considered sexual deviance is becoming not just tolerated, but accepted and applauded and lauded, it is not a stretch to think that things that have historically been completely unacceptable will start to be acceptable. I mean, there are, there is the man-boy love society. That exists. That's a real thing. And so if we don't talk about those ideas, if we don't say, hey, this is a line that we're drawing in the sand, then we may find ourselves in a place we really would like to not be because we haven't talked about those ideas because we're afraid of offending somebody. Right, and and... You know, yes, there are people who are offensive for the sake of being offensive, but ideas that matter that are are can be offensive because you don't like what it is that somebody is saying. One of my favorite movies, and you will probably, if you listen to this show long enough, hear me quote this movie over and over and over and over and over and over again. But it's 1776, and it's a musical, and um, it's about. The writing of the Declaration in the beginning of the independent the, the war for independence from Britain, and uh, John Adams is the main agitator for this, particularly in in the movie. They use him as basically the the, the lead, and he says, "We're fighting a goddamn war. We're going to have to offend somebody." And we've become so interested as a society about not offending anybody and being so politically correct that we aren't willing to stand up and say anymore, no, what you are saying is lies, and we are not going to say that 4 plus 4 or 2 plus 2 equals 5, because 2 plus 2 does not equal 5. 2 plus 2 equals 4. And that matters. And that's part of what story connections we want. We, you, you know, this is a very politically driven show. You sort of have to be when it's a dystopia novel. Dystopia. It's a show about dystopia novels, but that's part of what we want to talk about in story connections because books contain wonderful and terrifying ideas, and it is okay and good and right and it's as it should be that they contain wonderful and terrifying ideas. But if we don't talk about the terrifying ideas, then we don't have a way to figure out what we think and why we think it. And part of our problem is that nobody thinks about why they think what they think. They just think it until somebody says to them, wait, let's engage in some metacognition here. Right. I want to add something about not wanting to offend people. Um, My youngest daughter takes Russian lessons, and she has a wonderful teacher who is a... um, refugee from Russia. And Mrs. K and I were actually talking today about the difference between Americans and Russians in terms of not wanting to offend people. And Mrs. K was telling me that um, in Russia, women who dress immodestly on the subway actually get attacked, physically attacked 
by other women. And they yell things and they say things like, what is wrong with you? Why are you showing your body like that? How can you possibly be willing to do that? Are you trying to seduce my husband? I mean, things that people might think in the United States, like, wow, she's dressed like a whore, that we would never say out loud, or at least not to somebody's face, they say without any kind of shame or inhibition in Russia. But at the same time, there is a lack of discussion about political ideas. Um, and I think that when Americans are not willing to offend people on a personal level and we're not willing to offend people on a political level, we've got a problem because then we can't talk about the things that are changing our society in ways that we may not want it to change. Right. So we're going to wrap <laughs> that section up. And very quickly in this last couple of minutes, we're going to move on to more modern uh, dystopia novels. And the first one that we're going to talk about is called The Neuromancer by William Gibson. And um, I picked this book. It was published in 1984. It was the first book in cyberpunk, which is basically – Cy cyberpunk is basically in the cyber world a young disenfranchised person is basically the definition and it was the first winner of the science fiction triple crown which is the nebula award the philip k dick award and the hugo award so it had all of these awards that it had won it, it, lots of people said if you read dystopian novels you need to read this novel i got halfway through it and stopped reading it yeah i actually was bored out of my skull <gasps> And I got on Wikipedia and read the rest of the synopsis to find out what happened and was like, yep, no, don't need to read it. But I want to talk about it on the show for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that it has become, even if you haven't read Neuromancer, if I say The Matrix, you know what that is. And The Matrix is from The Neuromancer. And The Matrix is from The Neuromancer. The, the Matrix, and for anybody who doesn't know, The Matrix is basically this internet form that everybody puts their um has a neural connection to. has right has a neural connection to and everybody taps in and and that's how you interact and we're actually seeing that in social media we're have there are psychologists I'm, I'm reading parenting books right now and there are psychologists and uh doctors who are talking about you have to get off the internet it's actually changing the way that people's brains work well you, you know i've gotten rid of my facebook page i i did know that but i wanted to talk about it in that sense because we are it is a conversation about why having a matrix like world is a problem and while i thought the book was really boring the fact that it has become such a part of um pop culture yeah, I couldn't figure out why it read why it won so many awards because I just could not engage I, with it. I feel like you had to have been in 1984 in the science fiction genre to get why it spoke so yeah, deeply. Yeah, I was a senior in high school in 1984, and <clears throat> I don't have any recollection. Well, did, of this were you book. a big science fiction person? No. Okay, I think that's part of it. So we are up against a break. You are listening to Story Connections, and we will see you on the other side. <laughs> Intelligent local and national hosts, 1030 KVOI, Tucson's Intelligent Voice. Intelligent weekend talk that's live and local, only on AM 1030 KVOI, The Voice. Call in now, 790-2040. That's 790-2040. Hi, welcome back to Story Connections. We are talking about dystopia novels this week. And the last two dystopia novels that we want to talk about are both YA books, but they have are becoming part of the dystopia genre world that people talk about. Um, well, the other thing is, is that... A great number of books that are coming out for young people right now are dystopic. Yes. So the first book that we're going to talk about is The Giver by Lois Lowry, and it was published in 1993 and was the winner of the 1994 Newbery Award. And it's probably... 
I think that that's probably one of the first dystopic novels for kids. I can't think of an earlier one. I looked and I couldn't find one, so I'm going to say that it is. Um, and I could be wrong, but I, I honestly couldn't find another one. And I don't want to say that it's a gentle dystopia novel because it certainly isn't. But it talks about why we don't all want to be the same in a way that young middle schoolers, because it was written for middle schoolers, right. can really understand. So it's a book about a boy named Jonas who gets picked at his 12th birthday to become the receiver receiver of memory. Um, because in the society that he lives in, everybody has decided that they all want to be the same. So they don't have color or music or anything that makes life joyful. You know, families are, the way that families work is, is that they, um, there are breeders, there are breeders and they get, the parents get matched and then they get given children. Uh, they have to apply for children and they get given. Right, so the breeders are impregnated, they give birth, and then those babies are nurtured in a nursery until a ceremony where adults who have been matched together, um, are given the infant that does not is not related to them biologically. Right. Um, but they have some, but in order for that to work in this world, they have to give all, they had to give all of their memories to the receiver of memories. And um, Jonas is picked to become the receiver. And it's about that journey. And um, I read it. I don't remember how old I was the first time I read it, but I read it probably when I was about 11 or 12. And um, when I read it as a child, at the end of the book, I thought it had a happy ending. When I re reread it as an adult, having a completely different worldview, having read a lot more dystopia books, I had a different opinion. Um, and through a, conversa a conversation and doing some research, uh, Lois Lowry wrote four books. Uh, she actually turned The Giver into a trilogy, but it took her 20 years to do that. And you find out that, yes, in fact, the, the, the giver, uh, the, the, the receiver, the Jonas survives and that everything is good at the end of the book. Um, but it starts talking about why it matters that people have choices and why it matters that people – are different, why we need people to be different, why society is better when we are different. And along those lines is the next book that we're going to talk about, which is the Matched Trilogy. Um, Matched, uh, the Matched Trilogy was written by Ali Condi. Um, and Matched was uh, published in 2010, and then Crossed was published in 2011, and Reached was published in 2012. And this is a dystopia uh, trilogy that doesn't have a happy ending at the end of it, but it has a warm ending at the end of that. And by what I mean by that is that it's a dystopian novel. So she isn't going to go say everybody lived happily ever after and they all lived in a castle and everybody had white horses and pretty dresses because that's not realistic. But she says there is hope after struggle, that you can triumph through bad things and that there is that things are good. Well, I think more than that, I think it's, you know, unlike some of the YA dystopias that we've been seeing, in this trilogy, she says it's worth the struggle. Right. Whereas in some of the others that we've seen recently, it's not worth the struggle. And you don't know that until you get to the end of the book. You read, you know, the, right. the, the trilogy, because most of these have been coming out as trilogies, and you read the trilogy, and you're invested in the trilogy, and at the end, it's, you know, everybody might as well have just put a gun in their mouth and killed themselves at the beginning of, you know, right. the first because five pages. All, right, because all of what they went through, all of their strife, all of their struggle, all of their everything was wasted effort. Right, but I picked Matched also because it's very similar to The Giver in terms of, at age 17, everybody gets matched. There's algorithms that they use to match everybody. And uh, the heroine um, and the protagonist of the book gets matched with two people. And it's her journey to figure out why did this happen and who do I belong with? And, oh, my goodness, the society that I'm growing, and it's called the society um, that I'm growing up in, is corrupt and evil and dangerous and they give and us steals things and, from us and steals things from us and gives us pills to, for so that we will forget that we are being robbed and um 
while the protagonists are all teenagers, it's, a, again, a book that I, I suggest that you read because it speaks about true things. And I think that, you know, when, when our government is evil, when our government is wicked, we have an obligation to stand up and say, this is evil, this is wicked. Well, you know, the thing is about that, a lot of people that I know that lean left are afraid of letting people make choices because people make bad choices. And the Matched Trilogy is a extrapolation of what happens when you take away choices from people. And the truth is that choice is a very scary thing because, you know, God gave us free will and that free will means that we can sin and we can do terrible things to each other and we can do terrible things to ourselves. But God thought that that was so important that he gave it to us. Well, you know, when our government says, hey, uh, we think that you shouldn't be able to make that choice, what they're saying is we think we know better than God. And you see that in this this series where the the government, the society, has taken the place of God in people's lives. Right. So those are the books that we wanted to talk about for Dystopia, and you can find uh, links for all of them if you are interested in reading them at our website, whystoriesmatter.com. But now it is time for our book recommendation of the week, and we'd like to thank our sponsors, David Guthrie with Coldwell Banker. Mr. Guthrie has been in the real estate market for a decade and is one of the top five realtors in the state of Arizona for Coldwell Banker. He understands the fluctuations of the market and how to make sure that your buying or selling experience is a good one. You can get in contact with Mr. Mr. Guthrie at 520-406-4702, or there's a link on our website. Um, Susanna Townsend is uh, with Susanna Lynn Photography is an on-location natural light photography who has a love of capturing life's important moments. She does weddings, senior portraits, family shoots, and much, much more. You can contact her at SusannaLynnPhotography.com, and you can also find her contact info on our website. And my book recommendation of the week is a book called Little Brother, and it's a spinoff of Big Brother from 1984. And it is a book about a teenager who gets tried as a domestic terrorist by the Department of Han- uh, Homeland Security after a terrorist attack in San Francisco. And his discovery that in America, civil rights don't mean what he thinks that they mean. And it was a book that I read four years ago. I think it came out four years ago. And when I read it four years ago, it made me so angry that I just, I had to put it down and walk away and pick it up and keep reading and put it down and walk away. But it spoke some really, really true pertinent things. And when I knew we were doing dystopia novels, I knew it was going to be the book that we recommended. I recommended because I didn't want to talk about it and ruin it during the show, but it's a book that I want everybody to read. So um, it is uh, Little Brother by uh, Corey Doctorow, and you can find a link for it on our website. Catherine? Uh, my book is A Death Struck Year by Makia Lucier, and I have 51 seconds to tell you about it. So basically, it's about a young girl who decides that she is going to try and make a difference during the Spanish flu epidemic. And uh, she runs away from school, and she uh, goes to work as a nurse, and she risks her life, and she watches people die, and she discovers a lot about herself and about the way the world works. And I think it's really an inspiring book. Okay, and that's A Death Struck Year by Makila Lucier. Um, and, again, you can find uh, links to all of those books on our website, whystoriesmatter.com, or on facebook.com forward slash whystoriesmatter. So you have been listening to Story Connections with Rebecca Guthrie and Catherine Townsend, and we will catch you next week at 4. Thanks so much. See you then.